Okay, uh, well, um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on uh, which part of the world you're joining us from. Um, thank you so much for your time, um, for having me here. Um, I'm Sabine, Sabine Javeri, and uh, I am currently at um, um, NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, I'm originally from Pakistan, but I have lived most of my life in the UK and the US and now in the Middle East. I'm going to be talking to you today about teaching globally and thinking locally. Um, and these are my reflections on inclusion, diversity and decolonization. Um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about my motivation. Uh, thank you uh, for reminding us about the document. Um, yes, so I want to start by sharing my motivation. So, but before I do that, a little bit about the format of the workshop. So in this workshop, I'm going to be using storytelling, autoethnography, and dialogue to initiate a process of self-contemplation and self-cultivation. And I'm hoping that the end of this presentation, we can all come together to reflect and share our own pedagogical experiences of creating an inclusive classroom. Um, I don't come from um, a very um, analytical background, so to say. My training is in creative writing and literature. Um, what attracted me to innovative pedagogies is my own experience of being a person in color um, in sometimes a diverse and sometimes a non-diverse classroom. Um, so again, coming back to my motivations, why am I here? Why am I talking to you today? I am here talking to you in a language which is not my first language because when I was born in Pakistan in the late 1970s, a um, couple of decades after um, Pakistan came into creation, after 200 years of colonization of British rule, um, my parents um, at that point wanted me to learn the English language because English was currency. English was the language of um, importance, of prestige, of respect. It was the language which opened doors. It was also the language of the upper class and the elite because of the years of colonization. Um, I didn't belong to a very elite background, so my parents couldn't afford to put me in a private school. Um, I was asked to try out for a convent school, and these were schools run by missionaries, um, which provided an Eng English language um, curriculum in Pakistan. Um, I got into the school, um, and that was supposed to be something very celebratory because um, it was supposed to be very com uh, competitive. competitive. Um, excuse me, like I said, English is not my first language. Um, anyhow, my parents were very pleased, and um, there was celebration, and I was very proud of myself. On my first day of school, um, there I was, um, dressed in my crisp new uniform, wearing shiny black shoes, my hair slicked back, and very excited that I was going to gain an education, one that my parents couldn't have, my grandmother didn't have. Um, so first gen, but at primary level. So I entered the classroom and we were all asked to um, say our names and where we lived. Um, I said, Mira Naam Sabine. Hai. And the teacher who was um, a nun, um, fair skinned with um, light eyes, stood in the center of the room surrounded by children who looked exactly like me. And she said, say it in English. I didn't know how to say it in English. Um, actually, I did know how to say it in English, um, but I somehow got nervous or translated it directly in my head. And I said, name is Sabine. 
And the look that the teacher gave me was one of immense disappointment. And it was at that point in my life that I understood what power in the classroom meant. Instantly, I realized that this person was where power was held because this person had the power of language and this person was superior uh, while I wasn't. My heritage, my language, my knowledge was inferior to this person who stood in the, at the front of the room who didn't look like us. And from there on began a journey which had started um, in South Asia in 1835 with the Colonial um, um, Education Act of India, um, the English Education Act of 1935, um, which decided that um, British East India would replace the indigenous um, languages and curriculum of South Asia of United India of the time with English language instruction. So those 200 years of imperialization, colonization um, took one minute to be internalized within me. And I understood the power of English language. I understood the power of cultural superiority in a very subtle manner. And the effect of that was that I became alienated with my own culture, my own language, and I put all my efforts into mastering um, a language which wasn't my first language. So why does that matter? It matters because it taught me what it felt to be left out. It taught me what it meant to be at the margins. And I am now at a point in my life where I feel that I can challenge that hierarchy. I feel that this is a time where we need to reflect on these ideas of where power is centered and how it became centered there. We need to be talking about this internalization of marginalization, where it comes from, and how can we move away from that? Um, so on my slides, um, as you can see, I've written down that I can't tell you what to leave out of your teaching, but I can tell you what it feels like to be left out. Um, and just to sum up what I said earlier, growing up in a post-colonial country, I learned to chant rain, rain, go away on dry parched days and to appreciate the beauty of daffodils when I had never seen one. Later, as a young Pakistani bride in the UK, I won an unexpected scholarship to study at Oxford. Here, I learned that although I was on par with my peers in terms of academic performance, as a Muslim woman of color, my identity was often reduced to my religion or to my nationality. Either I was a representative of my kind or I was an outsider, ignorant of the cultural references being used in the British classroom. So again, these are the things which I want to share with my peers here today to reflect on how we can stop ourselves from reproducing these experiences in the classroom by being conscious of these experiences that people like me have had and are now trying actively to de-internalize by challenging these circles of power. Um, there's also some information about um, the English um, Education Act of 1835. Um, since we are talking about decolonization, um, this is something to keep in mind how English became the language of instruction. So anyhow, it was these performative incidents that made me realize the importance of decoloniality and inclusion in my own life. Um, 
And another thing that it made me reflect on that, yes, universities, institutions are places of learning, but they should also be places of unlearning. Because if we are to be truly inclusive and diverse in our educational practices, then we must, then we must first diversify our own minds. We have to challenge our own deeply um, rooted implicit biases, our own internalized prejudices. We need to acknowledge the reproduction of power structures and internalized prejudice, and that knowledge can be transformative as well as self-limiting. Change begins with the self. It's not just about the syllabus or the pedagogy. It's about changing the structure of minoritizing. So this um, should give you some idea of um, why I'm here and um, what I hope to bring um, to the discussion forum here. Some of the key ideas of my work that I want to discuss is um, the idea of internal work, that this is a journey of critical self-reflection, um, that it means reflecting on implicit bias, on uh, privilege, on intersectional oppressions, the prudal, uh, the, our prudal identities, cultural and in intellectual humility, empathy. Those are the key ideas that I slot under internal work, which internal work, I mean, work that we have to do on ourselves. Um, the second and third uh, key ideas are connected. So that's shared ownership, that this is not something that we can just, you know, walk into the classroom and put out there. Um, this is something that we have to work together with our students. We both have to take responsibility um, for inclusion, for cultural competency, for our racial literacy, for educating ourselves about um, multiculturalism, about cross-cultural diversity, about community, about, um, you know, uh, about things that we are not um, um, aware of. Um, and one way that we could do this is by engaging with the community, by inviting um, um, local members of the community, indigenous guest speakers. Um, sorry, I'm so sorry, but my um, doorbell is constantly ringing. If I could just have one minute, I'm so sorry about this. That's fine. Somebody has finally opened the door. Right. Um, so thirdly, mutual learning. Um, so for me, teaching is a mutual learning experience. And I think it's very important for us to remember that we are learning just as much from our um, students as they are learning from us. So it's OK to acknowledge our vulnerabilities in the classroom. It's okay to experiment with pedagogies. It's okay to invite um, innovative methodologies, innovative only because we are not familiar with it. Right. So I can see in the, in the chat, uh, in Kilab, Zindabad, um, and resonating with your key idea. So, which means that um, there are quite a few like-minded people in the Zoom room. So, we all, I mean, we're here, so we do know about decolonization. Um, what then, what does it have to do with globalization? So, what is decolonization and what is globalization? So decolonization, or at least the interpretation that I'm working with over here, is um, to be more reflective of what we teach and how we position its context, and also our own responsibility as um, teachers and as learners, especially in relation to others who may not share this position and privilege. 
So decolonization here means challenging perspectives through critical engagement and challenging power hierarchies in our learning and our teaching um, against the backdrop of a very challenging history of colonial practice and cultural imperialism and capitalist imperialism too, if I may add. Um, and what is glocalization? So for glocalization, I'm working with the description by um, by G. Mannion, um, which means that um, incorporating local pedagogical practices and local knowledge into global pedagogical practices. And this is especially uh, pertinent to where I am because um, I work in a global university um, in the Middle East where the student body is very diverse. They come from all uh, parts of the global um, south. We have students from uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, Egypt, Syria. Um, we have students from Korea, from Japan, from um, you know all parts of Asia, and then we have about you know ten to twenty percent from the global north as well. So we have a very diverse classroom, but the faculty isn't as diverse as the student body is. Um, and also the curriculum is very much what is taught in the global north. So what I'm talking about is especially pertinent in this part of the world. But then this part, we live in, we live at a time where there is no more I feel no more boundaries, no more divisions, you know, knowledge is being transferred, uh, you know, at Twitter speed. Um, we're constantly exchanging ideas. Um, so it's very important for, you know, these same kind of diverse practices to take place across the globe and not just be restricted to places where there is a diverse student body. Um, so, Glocalization here means incorporating local knowledge into global pedagogical practices. Um, and I will be sharing some examples um, to give you an idea of what I mean. Um, so at this point, you may be saying, okay, I've heard all of this before. I know what decolonization is. Now I know what um, globalization is well. How does this apply to me? Okay, it applies to all of us because I'm asking us to reflect on the internal work that we need to do. I'm asking us to reflect on the learning environment that we create. Um, is it reflective of our students' experience? Um, what happens when it isn't? Um, what are our expectations from our students? Um, are we challenging the kind of implicit bias that many of us um, are not often aware of, um, such as having lower expectations from students of color or for not acknowledging oral histories or lived experience, um, you know, not understanding um, that there are different canons in, uh, you know, in different indigenous knowledge, um, which is, you know, equally informative and equally important. And what kind of values are we then cultivating? How are we contextualizing knowledge? How are we situating it? How are we positioning it? Are we only teaching from a certain point of view? And I'd like to give you an example here. Um, when I was, um, when I went to Oxford, um, one of the teachers, um, we, ha we had an American teacher who was giving a seminar um, who talked about the world before and after 9-11. And while that is a very prominent reference in our times, for me, history began and ended with the partition of India and Pakistan, because that's what I had grown up 
uh, with. So we had pre-partition literature and you know post-partition literature. Um, it's okay. Of course, I understand and respect that there is, you know, pre 9-11 world and post 9-11 world, but that is not the only um, diverse, diversification of history. Um, what I'm talking about is that this was a cultural reference and it was not inclusive of the experiences of people who, you know, whose histories had been affected by other world events as well. Um, often people will give references from popular dramas or sitcoms such as Seinfeld or in Britain, there would be references from uh, Steptoe and Son. Um, I probably mis still haven't gotten it right. Um, and very often for students who are not from that, that background, those references don't make as much sense. Um, and very often they create a kind of um, bias, uh, which is, you know, one is lacking a kind of knowledge. So what kind of values are then we creating if we are not conscious of these kind of very, very subtle ways and dangers of marginalization that can be created in the classroom if we're not conscious of how vast this topic of decolonization, um, especially in the classroom, can be. And then I'm asking you to reflect on intersectionality. What do I mean by intersectionality? I mean the multiple perspectives and frameworks of gender, race, and class. And again, um, Using autoethnography, I'd like to give an example from my own learning experience, which is, you know, um, very often I would become the representative of all Pakistani women, um, even though, you know, um, class is a great separator within Pakistan um, as well, because, you know, on one hand, we have um, a female prime minister, um, Benazir Bhutto, who is a woman. Um, and on the other hand, we have, um, you know, uh, women like uh, Malala who get shot for even going to school. So even within Pakistan, the experience of women is so different um, that to generalize someone on the basis of their nationality. Um, so again, I'm asking, you know, to be conscious of um, these interlocking identities and intersectionality, um, which form the you know identities and plurality of experience of our students and then of course identity um, again how that is changing very quickly in the post-colonial and the colonial world as well how do we reflect on all these multiple um, identities values um, biases how do we position them within the arena of decolonization. Um, this is something that we have to reflect on internally, individually, and create a journey with our students in doing so. Again, why? Why is that important? And I would um, welcome your thoughts as well. Um, if you would like to, you know, put your thoughts in, in chat about any of these questions here, please feel free to do so. So for me, um, I think if we don't talk about this, then we don't really understand the importance of diversity and inclusion. We don't really get it that we are gatekeepers. And if we really want to make the world inclusive, and if we really want to cultivate those values beyond the classroom, then we really have to start thinking more deeply about this. And it has to begin with ourselves. And yes, that includes, you know, decentering historical imperial frameworks of reference expanding our st standards of knowledge formation, 
diversifying methodologies, course content, and of course, acknowledging local communities and indigenous knowledge um, and not stopping at those central canons, you know. Um, there are so many examples, and I'm sure that, you know, many of you um, are probably conscious of that already about how, you know, if we pick up a discipline, whether it's philosophy, whether it's literature, very often, you know, um, it would be a very, very single story. Um, and it would make you feel, uh, you know, as a student that philosophy began with the Greeks and ended, um, you know, um, uh, via Germany in the West. Um, same with psychology, but, you know, um, there are, at, at least uh, in this part of the world, I find it um, extremely um, interesting that, you know, coming from such a rich culture where there is Sufi philosophy, there is Hindu philosophy, there is Buddhist philosophy, there are so many different kinds of philosophies that, you know, introduction to philosophy would only be about, you know, um, the famous Greek philosophers or Western philosophy, um, not that there was East and West back then. Um, so that again is a construct, I feel, of our own making. Um, and again, you know, with any other discipline, with literature, um, you know, to be studying Shakespeare, um, of course, you know, wonderful, but then um, in that very century, what else was being, um, you know, read or written in other parts of the world, and why should that con come under world literature, um, you know, and not those central canons of literature or, you know, when we discuss the history of the novel. So lots of ways to incorporate the local into the global. And, you know, also to be conscious that, yes, we have limited space. Yes, students have limited, um, you know, concentration span. But what are we deciding to leave out at the cost of what? You know, if we have six readings, um, and we can't incorporate a seventh one, can we do away with maybe something which we consider a central canon um, to incorporate local knowledge or indigenous knowledge? Can we, um, can we acknowledge that knowledge existed before um, Shakespeare or within uh, that same time frame in another part of the world um, and was just as impactful? Um, and again, you know, how do we challenge what Chimananda Adichie um, calls the single story if we are only presenting one side of the story? So how can we really talk about inclusion if we are not talking about um, what um, you know, what is out there in the local community, in the people who came before us or the people all around us who form, um, you know, uh, the process of learning within our classroom and within our world. Um, because at the end of it, what is the end goal? Um, to keep in mind that information is transformative, right? Um, and that's why representation matters, um, not because we need to include more writers of color on our syllabus, not just because of that, but because when you see someone um, whose story you can relate to, when there is relatability, you then start pushing those self-limits, you know, those self-limiting beliefs when you see others like you. It is a big challenge to those kind of self-limiting internalization that many of us, especially those from marginalized communities, from communities of color, have internalized. And here I would like you to think back again to my own example as a young child in a school learning that English was important 
and my language wasn't. So knowledge is transformative and reflection of yourself in that knowledge or acknowledgement of your own heritage and you know methodologies of knowledge production is important in pushing the boundaries of, of self-limiting beliefs, especially when you're a student. And that's why representation matters. So really diversity and inclusion are interchangeable because the end goal is decentering. So that means that the commitment to decolonization is actually a commitment to decentering. Um, some very interesting things in the chat. Okay be coming back to that. Okay, so as many of you are putting in the chat, um, and thank you, Ajay, some really interesting uh, ideas there and reflections there. The real debate here is what? So I have this um, sentence, which um, many of you for whom, you know, who speak other languages or who have, you know, um, who relate to more than one culture may understand. The sentence is, why do I have to put myself in brackets? What does, what does that uh, mean to you if I say, why do I have to put myself in brackets? Let me just have a look at chat. What do we put in brackets? So feel free to jump in. So I guess we put into brackets something that needs further explanation, right? Or something that is an afterthought or something that doesn't belong in the actual sentence. Something which is part of it, but it's been marginalized. It's there to explain the meaning further, or it's there to add weight to the sentence, but it's not really part of the sentence that we're seeing. Very often that happens to language. Um, I remember that um, when I was um, um, when I was studying and I was studying writing, I would think of words which I couldn't express in English, and I would think, you know, there is no other word for. Um, there is no language for that word, you know, in Urdu or in Arabic or in Persian that I'm trying to say that there isn't an English translation. Um, and, you know, professors would say, oh, put it in brackets, you know, put the meaning in bracket, it's fine, you can use your word, but put the, and I would think you're asking me to put myself in brackets, you know. Um, when I teach writing or I teach creative writing, I encourage my students now to, you know, use a sentence through which um, the meaning may become clear. But if it doesn't, it's fine. The readers can do the work. They can look it up. You know, it's all about learning, expanding ourselves, our knowledge. So why do I have to put myself in brackets? You know, how... Again, those are very subtle creations of power, of power hierarchies, you know, putting foreign words in brackets, um, putting meanings in brackets, putting lengthy explanations, footnotes, instead of teaching students to engage um, with this idea of words which can't be translated and why, you know, what is the epistemology of it? So it's not always a positive, um, um, exchange. Uh, one exercise that I would like to share here um, with all of you is um, sometimes um, I teach, so I teach a course in um, feminism um, and women's writing, and I often use feminist pedagogies, uh, which as it is are inclusive pedagogies, but one thing that I like to do is I like to ask my students, um, what is the word for feminism in your language? 
very often um, there isn't one, or at least there isn't like a direct word for it. Um, and that will lead to a discussion into why there isn't a word for feminism in their language. Or I would ask them, you know, what is the word for um, sexual assault in your language? What is the word for rape in your language? And very often my students from South Asia or Middle East will say, oh, it's um, the, the word means, you know, being dishonored. And then we would start a conversation about why is it a woman's dishonor if she has been assaulted? And then it would lead us to, you know, talk about, talk further about power hierarchies and how, you know, power is invested um, through language and how victim blaming uh, takes place through language. So that's just an example of, you know, the power of language and why it's important to address um, words which can't be translated or words um, which, because words have power. Um, and of course, that also means, you know, managing conflict where students use words which are uh, not appropriate. But that's a very long debate. Um, so that is connected to, um, you know, embodied learning as well. So again, you know, using different sorts of inclusive um, pedagogies to encourage um, exchange of knowledge, um, formation of knowledge. One of the pedagogies I use in my classroom is what I called embodied learning. Um, because I come from a culture um, where knowledge was not just cerebral, you know, knowledge and learning also meant doing yoga and learning dance um, and singing. Um, you know, to be a whole person, you had to cultivate your entire being and not just your brain. Um, I like to bring that idea of embodied learning into the classroom. And very often I'd ask my students, you know, feel the text. You know, what does, how does that text make you feel? Does it make you tense up? Does it relax you? Um, you know, try and smell the text, try and sense the text, you know, try and feel the text. So embodied learning, you know, making noises in the classroom, feeling um, the texture of a text. Yes, it may sound very strange to those of us who are coming from a very colonial background of learning, of teaching, but, you know, think of um, Rabindranath Tagore School in India, one of the first um, kind of liberal arts colleges because, it, you know, it taught history, it taught music, it taught dance, it taught yoga, it taught all sorts of forms of learning together because that was supposed to be, you know, what an entire person was. So bringing all those different kinds of pedagogies into the classroom um, and also acknowledging our limitations and our vulnerabilities. Um, so another thing that I try and do in my classroom is, you know, acknowledge the fact that um, we are all vulnerable and it's okay to be vulnerable. I think what is not okay is when we don't acknowledge our limitations. Um, you know, for example, we have courses like um, the introduction to philosophy, but that philosophy will be very, very limited to, um, you know, a certain kind of philosophy. It doesn't talk about the different philosophies in the world, right? So I think that is where we need to bring changes. We need to say, okay, introduction to Western philosophy or Western thought um, and acknowledge our own limitations of our knowledge rather than try and put forward this idea that we are speaking for the whole world because this is what is worth knowing. And this is, uh, this is the knowledge that is powerful. And if you know this, you know everything, right? That is when we again disturb um, those hierarchies or, you know, that's when we create those powerful um, shifts uh, when we acknowledge our own limitations. Um, of course, again, that doesn't always go down 
very well. Um, you know, we often have students, um, especially in, um, in Asia, who are coming from um, an educational background where the teacher um, is supposed to know everything. Um, and it can be quite shocking um, when the teacher says, I don't know. Um, and it can be upsetting. Um, but on the flip side, it is also teaching the student that it's okay um, to be vulnerable and it's okay to acknowledge your limitations. And again, I'd like to give another example here, um, which is sometimes when I am teaching um, first years um, literature, English literature, um, they'll come into the classroom and I will tell them, well, I'm going to teach you English literature, but English is not my first language. Um, and I only um, went to school much later on in my life and blah, 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 blah. Um, and it doesn't, it's not, um, uh, I don't get a very welcome reaction. You know, um, you know, I'm a woman of color. I don't have the best of accents. And then I'm telling them English is not my first language. And, you know, I um, don't come from, you know, um, uh, the global north either. Um, so it's obviously, um, you know, a lot of students, especially students who are of color and who are of a similar background, um, you know, they're probably, you know, expecting um, a white teacher with, you know, either clipped British accent or, you know, an American accent and are slightly disappointed to, you know, find me there. But I think during the course of the semester, I think what it gives them is the confidence to know um, that it's okay to be who you are. And I think acknowledging our own vulnerabilities is very important rather than trying to enforce that there is only one kind of English or there is only one kind of accent or only one certain kind of person can teach English literature or only one certain kind of person um, can be a director or so and so. So yes, diversity, language, embodied learning, vulnerability, um, and then yes, situating. So again, one of the strategies that I try and include in my pedagogies is I don't leave out any text, but when I teach a text, I always try to situate it. I try and tell my students and engage them in a discussion that this was written when this was happening in the colonized world. And this is why you're reading this. Um, these were the conditions um, yes, we don't have too many women writers um, on the course um, when we are looking at 16th century or 17th century um, English literature, but this is the reason why we don't have so many women writers. Um, so creating and situating um, your text so students understand, again, the dynamics of power and why women writers at that time weren't being published and why they're only reading male writers. And then of course, um, reflection, self-reflection, um, extremely important. And one of the um, strategies that I use is journaling. I encourage um, a daily journal practice. And I tell my students that even if it's just one paragraph, you know, reflect, reflect on what you have learned and how do you think you can take this beyond the classroom? Why does it matter to you or why does it not matter to you? And that leads to self-cultivation, uh, which comes from the word um, yosin, which is an Arabic word and also exists in um, Urdu and in Persian, um, which is the coming together of three things, which is um, doing something well with grace, doing something good because it's a good deed, and um, doing something which is an act of service. So 
I try and incorporate these values of self-cultivation that it's, it's a product of three things. It's about growth, it's about grace, and it's about generosity. Um, so education is not means to an end, but an end in itself, that it's not for the grade, but it's for one's own development. And of course, lastly, empathy. Um, because I think without empathy, um, there is no point of being um, a teacher because empathy not only towards our students, but our students' empathy towards us as well, because that's what makes it a collective journey, a mutual learning experience. Okay, so you know, when I signed up for 60 minutes, I thought I would have lots of time, but I realize now I only have 12 minutes left. So um, I'll go through this a little quickly. Um, so I think, yes, okay. So some of the classroom activities that I do is, um, so I talked about, you know, how it's important to pay attention to the intersectionality and the plurality of identities. Um, why? Because again, you know, many of us um, cultivate Im implicit biases without being conscious of it. Um, and some examples is of, you know, of implicit biases that a student who doesn't speak English well um, may not um, understand everything. Um, or if someone is not taking part in the classroom discussion, um, it's because they have nothing to say, but it might be a language um, issue. Or, you know, if somebody is um, visibly identifiably Muslim, then they would know all about um, Muslim culture. So those kind of implicit biases. One way to challenge those is that when I have um, a new class, I begin by asking them, to write down six attributes of their identity. That way, they are the ones who tell me what is important to them or what facets of their identity are important rather than me gauging that, oh, this is a person of color, this is a Muslim person, this is a so-and-so and so. So I let them tell me uh, what is important to them about their identity. Um, I often ask them about a text that they love, and that also helps me get to know, um, you know, what is important to them. Uh, it helps me know about what they have grown up with, you know, at, uh, I mean, depending on whether they quote a text in Arabic, a to, uh, you know, a text in Urdu, a text in French, you know, it helps you understand um, what is, what is important to them. You know, what is literature to them? What is storytelling to them? I also um, ask the meaning and origins of their name because I feel that this helps us bond as a class. And it also gives us a perspective of the different languages and the diversity in the class. Um, often, um, if we have time, I asked I asked them to take the implicit bias test, which is something which is in the shared Google document. Um, and this is particularly important um, when um, I have students in class who um, have marginalized identities. Um, also because I, I like my students to put in their, to, to share their pronouns with me. Um, but being in, in a region where identities, gender identities um, are binary, um, often it can lead to um, challenging conversations. Um, so one way to lead into those challenging conversations, uh, the point of which is to for everyone to respect each other's identities and to respect um, um, each other's preference of pronouns or, you know, sexual identities, um, I asked them to take the implicit bias test and I asked them to take the test on gender or on race. Um, and that can help break down these kind of um, conflicting views about not acknowledging um, someone's, you know, pro pro preferred pronouns or someone's preferred um, gender identity. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, often when we are doing um, things which are challenging, some uh, such as you know, um, talking about decolonization, um, translating a word into your language. Uh, that often helps initiate a very interesting discussion as we go into the epistemology of the word. Okay. Um, so I think we have... We've got very... 10 minutes. Okay, great. Okay, I'll, I'll stop at five. So there's some time for um, reflections. So anyhow, um, you know, I'm happy to um, share my slides if anyone wants. Um, because there are a lot more. Um, but I guess I'll start wrapping up now. And what I want us to think about is that, you know, we talk a lot about decolonization. We talk a lot about diversity. We talk a lot about inclusion. But really, it's it's about healing, right? We, we've inherited a world which has been wrecked by colonialism, by racism, by slavery, um, and now by the pandemic. So as as teachers and as lifelong learners, um, we are also healers and we are on this journey of healing together as students and as teachers. And I feel that at the end of it, you know, it's about breaking down those boundaries of power that, you know, so-and-so is telling us, you know, this is right or this is wrong. And the other person is absorbing that knowledge. It's about you know, being on this journey of, you know, mutual learning and of exchanging knowledge and of learning from each other, of learning from our diverse classrooms, from our, you know, indigenous communities that we find ourselves in. And it's about being on this um, journey as um, healers together. So I'll start um, wrapping up now and uh, uh, just, you know, um, I have more slides on which I think are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so I think I will stop here and I will just say on this journey of healing, you will need empathy, courage, vulnerability, recognizing limitations, and of course, constant growth and critical reflection. Uh, I feel like I've started sounding like Deepak Chopra, but <laughs> anyhow, just try and remember what, how do you want to be remembered? I know legacy is a contested word, word but how do you want your students and your peers and your colleagues to remember you? Do you want to be remembered by your imaginative classrooms, by your embodied learning practices, by creating a mutual exchange of knowledge, uh, by sharing inclusive perspectives and equity? Or do you want to be remembered the way I remember that one teacher who stood in the center of the room and asked me to speak in English or to stay silent? So thank you, I will end here. And I'd like to end with um, a share in my language, Urdu, which says, Main akela hi chal raha tha, janabe manzil magar. Log saath aate gaye aur karwa banta gaya. Which means that I had set out alone on this journey to bring aray, aray, aray. <laughs> <laughs> But along the way, I kept meeting like-minded people and it turned into a karwa. So thank you for that. And I will stop here. And um, I think we still have five minutes. So if any reflections, thoughts, observations, questions, um, I would love to know. Um, also, there is a Google document which has um, some activities um, which are not mine, but I have cited where I have taken it from. Um, and it also has a link to the implicit bias test um, and some other um, strategies for you to use. So I'd love to know what your takeaways are from this. And I'd love to know um, if uh, you have anything that I could, you know, add on to my knowledge, um, any observations.
Thank you, Sabine. Thank you very much. There are a number of questions in the chat and comments, and I could probably request a G, please, to make some of the comments and questions. Sure, um, I can I can kick us off. I mean, thank you, Sabine, so much. That was such a wide ranging and eloquently put together presentation. And I think you see from the chat that you know you've taken us in a lot of different ways. I think the one the one point, and maybe this was kind of like a subtle point, a kind of sidebar to the broader point that you were trying to make. But um, I, I thought maybe if I, I could push you a little bit to talk about inclusion and uh, the idea of into what do we seek inclusion? Because I feel like that was a thread through a lot of what you were describing. And I, and I was thinking, you know, like, should six-year-old Sabine be included into that terrible nun's vision of what education is and Macaulay's minute and all this other stuff? I mean, really, it seems that transformation is, is uh, essential to your pedagogy. So I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on the strategies that you've described, the emphasis on transformation, and, and how that kind of helps us think beyond inclusion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, um, Ajay, that's, that's a great observation. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that include who? Who gets to decide who is to be included and who is to be excluded? And when I talk about decentering, um, the point that I'm trying to make is that who is putting us at the margins? You know, who is deciding that this is indigenous or this is marginalized and this is at the periphery or this is at the circumference and this is at the center. So for me, the very word inclusion is quite um, condescending in a way because it is then challenging this idea that we aren't equal partners, that this is not a mutual learning journey that there is someone who has to be included and it often brings to my mind this idea of a playground where there's a child who is you know uh, wants to join the game and someone takes pity on them and includes them um, in the game to be generous um, so I think we have to challenge that whole idea of inclusion and really think not from that perspective of the margins and wanting to be included but really think of ourselves as equal partners who are not including each other, but who are going forward with this idea that we are all learning from each other, you know? Um, and it's a mutual learning journey that this journey of knowledge um, formation um, is without those kind of power hierarchies where one person is including the other and another person is excluding another. And the whole idea of, you know, classical canons, the whole idea of, um, you know, accepted methodologies. Um, I think we now, especially at a time where there is acceptance and openness to this idea of um, cross-disciplinary knowledge, interdisciplinary research, I think we really have to start taking into account things like storytelling, um, oral histories, as you know, um, maybe qualitative research practices and really start challenging this idea of inclusion in the first place. Um, but that's how I feel. <laughs> okay, thank, thank I you, think, John. I think we should stop here because of the next presentation and give about a minute for the adjustment. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your patience. Really appreciate it.